A small town invaded by a foreign enemy, people forced to submit to a new regime, and a group of kids willing to fight back, the Wolverines. All of this can only mean one thing. We're comparing Red Dawn in this episode of Retro vs. Remake. Parker. And I'm Dan Bulick. Welcome to another episode of Retro vs. Remake. This is the series where we compare movies to their remakes. Join us as we answer the question, should this remake exist? Today's films are Red Dawn. Getting right into it, the original Red Dawn was made in 1984, starring Patrick Swayze, Charlie Sheen, C. Thomas Howell, Leah Thompson, Jennifer Grey, Harry Dean Stanton, and Powers Booth. Directed by John Milius, screenplay by Kevin Reynolds and John Milius, and music by Basil Poldoris. Red Dawn 2012, starring Chris Hemsworth, Josh Peck, Adrian Palicki, Isabel Lucas, Brett Cullen, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Directed by Dan Bradley, screenplay by Carl Ellsworth and Jeremy Passmore, and music by Remen. Dewadi. All right. Okay, Reggie, what is your first experience with either film? See, uh, I do have experience with the original film. When I was in high school, I do recall watching Red Dawn. I think um, every man is a, a coming to age, have their Patrick Swayze uh, phase. Uh, so between, you know, Point Break, Red Dawn, Donnie Darko, you know, uh, I'm a Swayze fan, so I checked out this film. And the remake, not so much, like, because, again, I worship at the altar of Swayze when uh, this remake came out. I said, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had never seen either film before. I was sort of familiar with the synopsis. I just knew, like, something about Russians taking over, and then it looks like kids, looks like Charlie Sheen and Patrick Swayze uh, stopped them. So that's all I knew. Didn't know anything about it. I don't think I've ever really seen any pop culture references to the original film. So totally fresh going into this. Sure. Yeah, I think from a pop culture standpoint, and I'm sure we'll get into this, this is of the time. It's like the 80s film, you're dealing with the Cold War, the Russians versus American relations. I, I just don't think that our feelings about Russia <laughs> uh, as we were growing up were the same as people in the 80s. Yeah. I'm sure it was a lot more relevant, although we still have some issues with Russia today. But I guess it's not the same fear. Um, but anyways, <laughs> um, the films are very similar in a lot of ways. A lot of the characters have the same names. Some of the plot has been changed. But um, let's go over a brief synopsis before we do our comparison. In a small town in America, we are introduced to Jed Eckert and his younger brother, Matt. One day out of the blue, paratroopers swarm in and their whole town is under attack. Jed, Matt, and some of their friends are able to make it out safely. Their parents have all been captured or killed. Some of the townspeople are placed in prisons or re-education camps, while the rest are able to live their lives if they accept their new overlords. I couldn't think of a better term. <laughs> this allows the kids to go in and out of town and get supplies and information. Jed and Matt's father is eventually killed, and they decide to fight back. The kids engage in guerrilla-style warfare and are able to defeat the enemy several times. They're able to get more supplies and free prisoners. Tony and Erica eventually join the fight, too. The resistance takes on the name of their local football team, the Wolverines, a name they spray paint on the site of every battle. As well as they are fighting, their luck starts to run out and the enemy hits them back hard. Members of the Wolverines get killed. Things look bleak for the group, but then they meet Tanner, who is currently in the military. He informs the Wolverines of what happened and how much of America has been taken over. The Wolverines and Tanner team up. More of the Wolverines die in both movies and their own respective ways, with the war still raging. The end. Kind of really glossed over the ending because it does get a bit different in the remake versus sure. that original. 
So where do we start with this comparison? Um, there's so much going on in both <laughs> films. I figure the best place to start was probably the beginning with the war beginning. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll kind of lead off here. So um, as you may know about me, I, I did study a little bit of uh, political science uh, coming up actually with a lot of focus on foreign relations. Um, I lived in DC for some time. So the beginning of the original movie is uh, incredibly dumb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, kind of like a screen crawl, just text <laughs> on a black background explaining that more or less Russia has had a famine, which caused them to invade parts of like Poland or something like that, I think. Um, the Cubans in the Nicaraguans have amassed a large standing <laughs> army. The Germans don't want to be involved. Um, the United Nations just collapsed. Um, and then America is basically mano e mano with the commies. Politically, I find that hard to <laughs> believe <laughs> that set of circumstances, but that's what's been presented in this film. Yeah. And <laughs> going from there, after explaining all that, and just in case you didn't know what was going on with uh, this new war, you've got this small town Colorado school where your, your notes are great here because <laughs> this happens pretty quickly. I mean, <laughs> it's Swayze and, I, and Charlie Sheen sitting in uh, dad's old pickup looking at the scoreboard of the high school football game, and damn it, the Wolverines lost to the, to the Grizzlies, 13 to 21. And, uh, you know, we're getting some exposition here. Patrick Swayze used to be a jock. Um, Charlie Sheen, clearly the quarterback, or something like that. It was like, yeah, we lost. So these guys, small town losers. Um, <clears throat> Charlie, okay, <laughs> Charlie's let off in class. Uh, his teacher's just like, yeah, the Huns and wars and stuff like that. And then Russians just, you know, paratroop <laughs> in their high school field and uh, just like start laying in. <laughs> like, you feel bad for the, uh, the the teacher. He goes outside, hey, gentlemen, can I help you? <laughs> and he's dead. It's just chaos. Um, somehow Patrick Swayze doubles back in his pickup, grabs an assorted group of teens, and they like <laughs> drive off towards like town. So I know that sounds like a lot, but uh, like your notes say, that's like four minutes into the movie. It's it was, yeah, it's it's completely insane. Like I said, I've never seen this before. So you know, you're a little bit introduced to the characters. Or actually, let me go back to that. The, all that yeah. text. All that shit about, like, the United Nations falling apart and Russia has a famine. It doesn't fucking matter mm -hmm. at all, man. Really? I, I, I was just like, first of all, that information goes by so fucking fast. You're not able to really process it. Like, okay, I got to remember who now? What's happening? It doesn't matter in the overall plot and the overall thing. Could have done without it. Um, it was whatever. So we have, like, a minute and a half of that plus credits. <laughs> and then we get three minutes, just three minutes with our main characters. Well, two of them at least. Well, I guess technically three of them. And then, you know, before I even am able to remember their fucking names, <laughs> we're already at war. It was just insane. I, I couldn't believe, like, I thought, like, maybe we'll get, like, a half the movie where we're just dealing with the small town and then the other half where we learn how they want to fight back. Nope. <laughs> no, no time's wasted at all. Let's get to the action right away. Let's blow this teacher away. Bam. Four and a half minutes into the film. All your action. Your war starts, and then it just never stops. Right. Right. And, you know, we, we're talking about this kind of, like, 1980s feeling. Because of uh, the Cold War and just American feelings about Russians, you know, the uh, nuclear bomb drills people did in high school, like the, just the, you know, some valid, but some outlandish fears about um, this foreign enemy uh, has led us to the point where you don't need a plot. So to your point, you didn't even need that opening crawl. You could have just said it was the Russians. Right. Um, because it didn't matter who was fighting them, clearly. <laughs> All that matters is that the, the, the commies came and they attacked us and we're going to fight back. And that is literally the plot of the movie. 
Um, everything know, they, else they is, go out yeah. of their way to make it like plausible. It's like, well, it's not just the Soviet Union, you know, they got the Cubans and the Nicaraguans, you know, because they're, they're near, they're closer. So it makes more sense for them to, it's like, you could have just said it was the Russians and I would have bought it just as much as I'm buying this nonsense with Cuba and Nicaragua. It, yeah, yeah. it was just overly complicated for this simple idea. It's the Russians. It, it was, too much. That's all it had to be. But yeah. you know, um, you know, again, it, at that point though, when you think about the Cold War, it's not just about the Russians because ultimately, if we beat the Russians, whatever, we have to beat communism, right? <laughs> and clearly, with our outside of these movies in our own country, communism is still something that we're actively <laughs> debating about amongst ourselves. So, um, you know, uh, I get it. I just don't get why they felt the need to try to explain more than they had to in this case, you know. Um, the guys, like, literally landing on U.S. soil is enough for me, um, mm -hmm. to your point, to try to make that part plausible. I think they're putting their attention in the wrong areas when it comes to plausibility. So um, I, I personally thought that the opening was just not, not great. I do remember as a kid watching that scene and being like, oh shit, like they parachute in. I remember being kind of impressed at the time, but it's because I knew nothing about foreign, <laughs> foreign relations, you know? Um, the remake tries a little bit harder to make us care about these people um, by actually showing us the football game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lead your team nine, take us to the house, Edgar. Hut. <laughs> We, you know, we got, um, uh, which I was surprised, actually, uh, Chris Hemsworth, you know, we got, I thought it was going to be Liam Hemsworth for some reason, <laughs> <laughs> the lesser Hemsworth, but, uh, no, we, no, we got, got Chris Thor. Hemsworth. Yeah, we got Thor in this movie. Yeah, we got Thor, um, and clearly an attempt to, uh, get him enough star power to be in other films. <laughs> um, uh, he's sitting out there, uh, in the parking lot, in his pickup, listening to the game instead of walking 10 feet over watching the game. Uh, I guess he probably gets too emotional, but his, his brother, played by uh, <clears throat> Josh Peck, is the kind of star quarterback of the team. He's a bit of a hot shot and a hothead. We see that there. Um, again, just like the international relations in the first film, the football intelligence in this film is, is terrible. Like, he's playing really bad. Uh, <laughs> I, I know they're trying to make that interesting, but, like, Kick the field goal. I, 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 don't get, I don't get what's happening in this movie. Um, but again, you know, like we get background on uh, Hemsworth's Jed. We get background on Josh Peck's Matt. We, we see the father. So like uh, we see Matt's girlfriend, which um, is a, in addition to this film. So they're making us again, at least try to care about these characters before diving into mm -hmm. the insane sequence 11 minutes into this film with the Koreans <laughs> parachuting <laughs> into America. And let me tell you something. Um, I know we're not at this phase of the conversation. I'm gonna have to give a, a slight nod to the original for real guys parachuting versus the remake with that CGI was, that was rough. <laughs> It it was rough to watch, but it was also just like so cheesy looking in the original. Cause like there's like what ten guys <laughs> just like paratrooping. At least it looks like a whole like army or something in the remake. So yeah, everything's gonna look a lot more CGI, but it just looks so cheesy in that original. Yeah, right. that I was just like, ugh. But I mean, of course, it's expected in this early '80s movie, so I'll give it a pass. But I mean. It was okay. I didn't. I didn't really mind. I, I don't really knock terrible CGI because I'm not expecting much <laughs> from right. either film, right. honestly. Yeah. So, to to your point, um, with my issues with the CGI side, the actual, I think what you're hitting on is the scope. This remake does make it appear again plausible <laughs> that this is happening because you've got fighter jets, you've got just hundreds of troops in the sky, um, just melee explosions and stuff like that uh it does feel a lot more realistic and because it's 2012 we have this um we have tension with the koreans 
instead mm-hmm. of the Russians in this scenario. Yeah, and they I, they do something different instead of like just a bunch of text in like in the original film. They actually show news clips, so it's like, oh yeah, that's that was what's happening uh, back then. You know, you have the then President Barack Obama there. You even got current President Joe Biden uh, making a few clips. You got Hillary Clinton in there. You know, just yeah. talking about the threat of North Korea. So it's sort of like a quick way without kind of spelling it out like this is what's happening in the world right. they're able to just like put a news clip here or there just so you can piece together okay so there's something about north korea so they're probably going to be the main bad guy so i thought that was a more clever way than just spelling it out right like in it was film. it was certainly better um one using sort of footage and i'm sure there's some uh you know kind of editing in there too but like using footage of the day showing kind of that there is tension between the U.S. and Korea in a real way uh, introduces this plot a lot better. So, I mean, really w- what we're getting at here is exposition. And so far, the remake is leaps and bounds ahead because mm-hmm. we're looking at real footage, we're looking at a plausible scenario, and we kind of know a little bit about our um, our characters that are going to be affected, you know? Right. In yeah. a pretty short amount of time, they, they pulled that off. Yeah. Like you said, um, we're only at like 11 minutes before the war starts, but we get a lot of information about the main characters in the remake that we didn't get in the original film. Like I wrote down in my notes, like we know that Jed has has military experience and that he's been away for a while. Um, we know that Matt is dating Erica, then they're an item. And then we know that there's this Tony girl and she's sort of interested in Jed. And then we see it, we see them interact with their father a little bit. Um, Matt and Jed. So, you know, we get a sense of who these people are and then their relationships with one another. It, you know, sort of not effectively, but, you know, just making them a little more relatable than just three dudes in a pickup truck talking about some football game that we never see. Right. And you're not even sure. It's like, are they even brothers? It's like, who's, are all three of them brothers? Like, I didn't know the relationship between right. all three of them at first. And then it was just like, like I said, before I even know their names, it's like they're already at war. So it's it's really hard to root for people like when you don't know a single thing about them except that one played football, one plays football. And then so, you know, I give it points to the remake for at least establishing some characters here. Mm-hmm. It's not the best establishment of characters, but at least they tried and like, you know, I got a sense of who these people are. Yeah. Yeah. The the remake has a lot more nuance, <laughs> um, sort of human interactions versus the original, right. which does not, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's important because, you know, when you say the plot out loud, it's pretty fucking absurd. <laughs> so you need to grasp onto something and being able to, you know, grasp onto the characters, that's that's a good place to start. Yeah, yeah. The, the 80s movie, just kind of moving forward, since we are talking characters a little bit, um, as we mentioned in the, uh, in the remake, it's Chris Hemsworth playing Jed Eckert. We inherited our freedom. Now it's up to all of us to fight for it. In the original, we have the iconic Patrick Swayze playing Jed Eckert. So that's what he'll call you, man. They know who all of you are. They're looking for you. His own portrayal. It's just it's so over the top, right? Like this 1980s character is, you know, I get it because he is older than them. They're all high schoolers. And they actually, the high schools in general come across kind of even more childish in this original, just because one, we don't know anything about them. So he basically kind of big brother bullies them into like <laughs> listening to him. Um, you know, you beat up one nerd and then the rest of the nerds fall in line basically. And again, at this point, still nothing. Like, right, who is this guy? <laughs> He played football. He drove the pickup out of town. Like, who is this this man? I still undetermined. But you know, as the plot moves forward, we realize that yeah, he has some survival skills. Like, clearly, their father used to take them into the mountains to go hunting and uh, you know, kind of rough it, as people would say. So we have that. <laughs> yeah, that's all I could tell you really about his past. Like. I know he used to play football, some experience hunting. That's all I know about him. That's it. They, they, they never go any deeper. That's it. And does he date? Does he like, what, what, what's his job? You know, like, what does yeah. he do? What has he living? done since football? I, I don't know. I know he tries to pick up 
so maybe he moves lumber. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. And, and also, um, even being a signal, like you mentioned on that opening scene, why is he back? Like, you know, I get why they're in school. I don't get why he's there. Because it seems like they're in class at that point. You know, I got to imagine it's not like, uh, what's it, home what home period? Or I, I don't remember. I have been in high school in some time. <laughs> no, it's, it's not homeroom, right? Like, right. at least in first period here. So yeah. Learn about the Mongols. That's not homeroom shit. So was he just, like, hanging out by the high school that whole time? I'm assuming that he lives in town still. Like, he didn't go away like Chris Hemsworth's Jed did. Yeah. I just assume he just, uh, after high school, he just got a job and just stayed local. Yeah, yeah. I'm I mean, just putting I, that all together. I couldn't tell you. No, nah, I know you. I, I, it's not there. But, like, <laughs> even, like, when the Russians attacked, why is he there? You know, like oh, why is he still like near the high school? Right, because he right. clearly should be at work. Oh, that's right. what you're saying. Um, <laughs> traffic, so he didn't get far. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> maybe he's fixing a flat that whole time. Like I don't know. But, like, yeah, maybe <laughs> his response time is insane. Yeah, he's again, right there. That's right. <laughs> so, so again, like like we're mentioning here, clearly we don't know who this guy is. He, for, there's no reason why he's there when they first get attacked, and um. Again, because all I know is that he's a hunter. I mean, so so what? You know, like, all right, you could maybe survive a couple of weeks in the woods without supplies. I mean, that what's that supposed to do for you? To your point, Chris Hemsworth is Jed. We do get some background. You know, mm -hmm. he talks to people. They talk <laughs> about their backgrounds and past. Like, he clearly has tension with his brother. Right. Because his brother's a bit of a, a kind of a cowboy, a bit of a hothead. Um which, you know, just comes with youth, right? Like, I think that's part of it. Right. So the sibling rivalry is, is a good element. Um, mm -hmm. Giving his brother a girlfriend is a good element uh, in the film. And giving him that background with some military background was pretty smart. Yeah, especially when you have to train a bunch of people who don't have any military backgrounds. And, you know, you have to fight people who are in the military. <laughs> it might... <laughs> be good, useful if somebody knows <laughs> or has some you know experience in the military oh wait this guy does okay so that was that was great <laughs> that he has this military background and the tension with him and his brother that's great too because it gives the relationship somewhere to go yeah so you know you set up these things in the beginning and we can go somewhere with it the original <laughs> film we, we just nothing set up. I don't know if we have, where do we go when there's no starting point necessarily, you know? You, you fight the Russians. I mean, the, like, you, like you're saying, the, the remake, when he disarms that kid, which, you know, happens in the original, but when he disarms him, he does it with a little bit of flair, right? It's not just, I just pushed over some high school kid. Like, he's using, like, actual military tactics, you want to make another appearance after you made an appearance on the thing? Silly puppy. Ace has more background in this podcast than <laughs> Patrick Swayze's character. <laughs> it's not wrong. Nah, but, you know, um, I'm not sure how Chris Hemsworth related to anybody in that town. Just looking at him. <laughs> yeah, he's like three feet taller than the tallest guy in that town. It's, it's absurd. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, uh, <laughs> we didn't get to it yet, but uh, Josh Peck plays uh, his brother Matt in, um, in the remake, and that role is uh, a Charlie Sheen role in the uh, original film. And, you know, looking at both films, neither of them look like they're related to their, their <laughs> brothers, so that's consistent. But, you know, Hemsworth is just, he's Thor, right? Like, right. Josh, uh, you may not know a lot of background on Josh, but he used to be a bit of a heavier guy in his Disney uh, days. He was on, he was a child actor. Um, he kind of slimmed down, and you know, I think he was looking for roles like this. But it's Chris Hemsworth. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like me or you with a gym pass for uh, three months is not going <laughs> to hold up. But no, again, I did as much as I often don't like <laughs> arbitrary sibling rivalries. Um, they're at least a, you know, it's at least a trope. It's at least a character right. with an arc. So yeah. I was I was okay with it in this film because, like you mentioned, this plot is already so thin in both films that give me something to work with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the remake does that. I'm trying to think of any other 
characters that were introduced in the remake. I mean, we get the dad, slightly different job. He's a cop in the remake, which would make sense when they see him later, why he has to stay, you know, while everybody else has to go. It's like, you go here because I'm a cop. I got to help these people, like just help deal with the situation. As opposed to the original where we don't even see the dad and I don't like no adult just goes with the kids in the original. Like every adult like gives them guns and supplies. They're like, all right, here's your stuff. Go go in the mountains. It's like, well, why don't you go with the kids? They're clearly children. You can you can help them. And uh, um, you know, by making the dad a cop, at least he had a reason to stay. Because they use the only adult I really remember them interacting with um, after the invasion. But in the original, I feel like they interacted with a couple of adults and they just never went with the kids. There's several times where they get introduced to the adults. And that is kind of, uh, that point you're bringing up is very consistent in this movie because, uh, you know, we haven't gotten into sort of the guerrilla warfare fighting style. But given what we see here, there's this kind of idea of uh, the city under siege. Once the Russians or the Koreans or the Nicaraguans or the Cubans <laughs> pick your foreign entity, um, once they land... The commies. We'll just say the commies. Yeah, once the communists <laughs> step in, um, these towns get sort of taken over in a very sort of stereotypical uh, fear-mongering way that communism is portrayed. It's like basically soup lines and <laughs> and, uh, surveillance and stuff like that but not you know at, at the same time though it, in the remake it makes sense like you mentioned when adults push back right like there's this whole secret network of uh people resisting and it's outlined it's clear um and it's consistent in the original there's no consistency to this like you you walk up to a guy that owns a general store here's some spam and a uh, bullets i i guess i'm just gonna stay here and <laughs> and what dot like i like, <laughs> like you said why like you he has a car too like he, he, they're at a gas station yeah. leave <laughs> you know um anytime anyone gets what appears to be liberated in this original film their ranks never get bigger right. their network of uh of you know assistance doesn't expand so it's just like this random kind of, uh, and we'll get to this, but it's this random running and gunning with no one deciding that they've had enough. And at least in the remake, as their sort of legend grows, these, these Wolverines, these guerrilla fighters, their influence increases. There's more people in town that like help them. And it's just, it's a strange, strange choice in the original movie. Yeah, because it's, it's really bizarre that they don't take anybody they rescue with them because most people that they rescue are to be executed. So they just free them from, or just save them from the execution and then go, okay, you can go back to town and surely the uh, ruling communist won't mind you coming back and all your executioners are dead. Right. It's like, you're just throwing them back to more danger while you could, you know, protect them and increase your numbers at the same time. So it was just, it was really bizarre to see them keep doing that. Right. <laughs> that was consistent. The inconsistency right. of that. Like, we're going to save people and you, we're going to leave you on your own. It's like, well, just take some of them with you. You're like eight kids. Think what you could do with like 50 adults. I yeah. mean, you could take the town back like overnight. It, it's such a bizarre choice. It's such a strange choice. And uh, like you said, the, the original movie, and often in our podcast, we don't talk about the original movie nearly <laughs> this much. But <laughs> in the original movie, right? They go up into town. And the one thing I do appreciate about the original film is that the passage of time is much more apparent because there's, again, literally screen crawls that say September, mm -hmm. October, you know, and I think this story plays itself out all the way into the winter. I think it's like February by the time everything's uh, wrapped up. So like we know we're basically kind of looking at this five month period. We don't, even though we have that time clearly defined, we don't see what we, seeing the remake, which is Hemsworth training them, right? right? Like Hemsworth, and trust me, it's goofy. It's nonsensical. Um, as a person that's trained in martial arts, I haven't really trained with weapons or anything, but like, I'm sorry, you're gonna need a couple years to really, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
to get to a proficient level with uh, fighting and um, firearms. But you know what? Whatever. At least they trained. At least I can see this progression from not knowing anything to knowing something. In this original movie, they start, okay, they go out in the woods, uh, you know, you shoot one deer, basically. And the next thing you know, they got ghillie suits and they're, <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> What, why are they now trained? Like we didn't, we were robbed of our '80s montage. <laughs> that's that's a valid point. I mean, I can't believe that there's an opportunity for montage right there and nice cheesy pop song and yeah. completely just they just missed Rock. that opportunity. I don't know why. Give us some Rocky Four action, you know, that's... like pick up the uh, <laughs> the sled, you know. Yeah, chops, you know, <laughs> just get an axe, yeah. chop some lumber, you know, Roll lift some beers. logs. <laughs> yeah, come on. Just... Perfect right. opportunity for some 80s cheesiness in there. Get tough, man. And, you know, again, I, I don't love the training sequence in the remake, but at least it's there, right? Right. And I think, I think that we're kind of coming across this recurring theme. At least it's there. Right? <laughs> this original film, like I mentioned, because of tensions with communist countries that obviously, like I mentioned, still pervade today, people were apparently very willing to just say, oh yeah, yeah, some tough, real Americans going out there, uh, you know, they know how to hunt, they know how to shoot. Yeah, if I was a real American, I'd be able to do the same thing. I was like, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Why would <laughs> It's a trained foreign part, like it's their version of the Marines. Like uh, kids who can't win a high school football game are gonna get their asses kicked <laughs> in this scenario. But whatever, Let, let's just give them the advantage of, like we said, of knowing the, the woods, knowing how to kind of disappear in, in an area where these people don't. But uh, again, it does not excuse what we were talking about. You just took out 20 uh, Russians, Cubans, whatever. There's like a whole cache of firearms and explosives that these, like you mentioned, eight kids keep using. And you just liberated like 30 people. Where, like, where are they going? pick up arms with me, <laughs> let's, let's fight. In this remake, they do a really good job of, you know, as, like I said, as people get liberated, they're like, yeah, we're part of this too. They'll pick up guns, they'll fight back. So it's plausible that this fight could drag out for a while because the communists in the remake don't have the same level of control. Uh, people are actively fighting back against them and it's very clear how that's happening through this, like, again, this underarm, under, excuse me, through this underground, like, this person gives you food, this person gives you um, weapons, and, like, it's all defined and explained. So, again, in terms of the training and setting up for this task of fighting back, the remake is winning again because it makes sense how they're fighting back. I don't even know where to jump in on this one. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'll just go into the, the guerrilla warfare a little bit in the original film. I mean, that's why you don't need a training montage, Reggie, because of the guerrilla warfare. You know, the biggest thing that these kids, the Wolverines, have in the original is the element of surprise. And you don't need training on any soldiers with years of training as long as you have the element of surprise over and over and yeah. over. <laughs> For four months. <laughs> It's insane, like, you know, okay, maybe the first couple of times, like, oh, man, th these kids, we didn't see them coming. But, like, after a while, and then they're spray painting Wolverines, like, okay, it's the same group of kids who keep doing this shit and just surprising mm -hmm. us. You think, I don't know, some military mind would be like, well, you know what, maybe we should prepare for these kids who keep sneaking up on us and not being caught with our pants down consistently. But even, like, towards the end of the movie... They're still getting surprised, like, what? Where are these kids coming from? I don't right. understand what's happening. Right. And then these are trained military, you know, soldiers who don't know how to shoot for shit. They're like the worst shots than stormtroopers are in the Star Wars films. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. Like, kids, none of the Wolverines die till like, towards the end of the movie. Yeah. And that's because they get, like, too cocky around tanks and shit. Yeah. It's just insane how bad the military is versus how good these kids with no military experience right. just 
how good they are. And then they're just like wildly firing <laughs> as they scream, like, ah! And then like in two seconds, like every enemy is dead. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's your action sequence for like every for little- For every <laughs> single scene. Every single scene. Okay. And it the never... only thing that changes are their outfits. <laughs> Oh, oh, some fantastic outfits they have when they get the like <laughs> when they have like leaves and different branches like strapped to their Little arms on their, their, their heads. It's like, oh, fantastic. I, that's what I want to see a montage of too. Just them making these various outfits to fit yeah. into these surroundings. Because their winter kit was pretty good too. <laughs> I wrote in my notes like, where did they get <laughs> this winter camo from? I think they got them from Hoth. <laughs> the planet in Star Wars. Oh, yeah. man. It's just, it's absurd, right? Like, I, I appreciate, like you said, the first time around, I the guys jumping out of the hell, uh, excuse me, out of the planes, shooting up the high school, boom, haven't seen this before. Right. The first time one of those kids picks up a gun, shoots an RPG, their hats are flying off, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> <it's> great. <laughs> And they did it again. Wolverine! And then they did it again. Wolverine! <laughs> and then they did it again. <laughs> <laughs> and like the only variation is one time they like popped out of the ground <laughs> once right. which was like I kind of enjoyed that because it was a little bit different <laughs> <laughs> but like you're right how many times are you going to watch 20 people in like a, a, a line about to get a firing squad shooting at them and then the Wolverine's popping up shooting uh, all the trucks and blowing them up and stealing the supplies and, and like and again without that element like we were saying of the now liberated people joining them. What's the point? Right? Like, where, where does this end? Because the movie does, it takes time for it to find its footing of saying that they had a goal of actually getting to uh, less occupied America, right? So you're almost halfway through the movie before they decide that's their plan. That, it's unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> it's unacceptable. And, and they're yeah. just like impervious to like, the bullets like they don't get hurt like they're kind of like superman in a way like there's no danger because they just kill the soldiers instantly there's no like repercussions for them freeing the people there's no repercussions to them like for their actions so it's like where's the stakes i mean yeah their parents are captured and we do see the dad get killed but again it's like I don't. I don't know him. You didn't ever tell me who he was. Like, I'm meeting him when he's already in the camp. It's like, I, I'm not emotionally invested in him. So, I don't care. I care about the kids, kinda, because like I'm kind of following them. But even then, like, I don't even know who these kids are still. So, to your point, we've got this this father figure who the first time we meet him is in this camp, and so in the a dad. I'm oh, sorry. I just wanted to go over the uh, the casting because he's a pretty famous actor in the original so in the, i just wanted to say in the original film we have harry dean stan playing the father where's my dad mr Ecker? in the remake it's brett cullen as the father yeah. the police father boys i love you both but i want you to do what i would do kill this piece yeah who my my wife was like is that sean being I'm like no nah, it's not <laughs> but <laughs> pretty cool but uh, Harry, Harry Dean Stan's character in the original film, like you mentioned, we're not introduced to him until he's in the camp. Mm -hmm. And at that point, like you said, we don't know anything about him. But in a way, because of how ridiculous of a character this is, we do learn a lot about our, our leads in this right. sense. Dad's just like, let me tell you some boys, <laughs> don't you let these communists capture you. Um, and don't you cry either. Don't ever cry. Never, ever cry. No That's... crying, <laughs> especially about your dad being captured by a foreign enemy <laughs> and tortured. Don't you cry and never think about me again. I was tough on you boys. 
Now you know why. Because <laughs> I knew one day we'd be invaded by commies. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about, old man? I, I, I know that the movie is fueled on xenophobia. Like, I know that. <laughs> but let's dial it back a little bit, you know? Just this idea that, like, yeah, I used to kind of, like, I'm presuming beat you guys up a little bit, make you go out in the woods and do crazy shit. Um, so that when the commies come, not if, when, you'll be ready. And it's just, it's just a very, um, it's a strange portrayal in, again, going back to what we said about this liberation aspect of their guerrilla warfare. It doesn't make sense because you're releasing guys like that. Why would that guy, like, not take up arms? Like, you know, it just doesn't, Again, it doesn't make sense that the people that would be in the camp would be people that have that type of sentiment towards communists. Mm -hmm. And yet when you free them, they just kind of like, ah, run around and then we're free. Like, it, I don't know. It's, it's as if they stopped having agency <laughs> um, the minute, you know, the Wolverines show up. It's like, these are just people that are victims for us to be more good guys, basically. Yeah, right. it, it was a bizarre setup. Um, the whole re-education camp thing was just bizarre to me. Like, first of all, that like anybody could just walk up to these re-education camps and yeah. just talk to the prisoners. It's like, wouldn't you be like weary of like anybody approaching that camp? Like, maybe they're gonna try to break them out or like you know, just plot with them or something. Why would you just let anybody up to these camps and like, ah, they're just kids. Uh, don't worry about him. Like that, that idea was just absurd to me. And then just the f terrible fatherly advice he was giving them, like the obvious advice, like don't get captured, like no shit. Yeah. <laughs> and the no cry thing, don't, don't you ever cry. And then when he gets killed, he's like, don't you cry for our father. It's like, yeah. Jesus, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> it's weird. I mean, like clearly whoever wrote the screenplay was like, this is what tough guys do. They don't cry. They, they go out in the woods, they'll leave every notion of their past behind. Um, anyone they ever were friends with, liked, enjoyed their company, doesn't matter. When it's time to get tough, you get tough. And it, it just creates these one-dimensional characters. And that's why I think we're getting this one-dimensional series of actions. It's like, where do they, where do they go, right? Like, they're already kind of like... Uh, at this point, soulless killers, and like there's right. this element of one of their ranks that is sort of becoming darker and more hate hateful, mm -hmm. but it's not very far from anyone else in, in the team. So what was yeah. the point? Yeah, because the father is introduced and it's like whatever. And then they become, you know, soldiers, the kids, the Wolverines, they start killing, and then the father gets killed. And it's like, okay, well, that didn't push them over the edge. It doesn't exactly set up like a revenge scenario like it does in the remake where they're like oh shit so it drives the story forward the murder of the father in the remake it doesn't really do anything in the original other than letting us know they had a tough upbringing because they don't really like after he's killed like he's not even allowed to mourn for him because you right. can't cry you don't ever cry so it's like all right so what was the point of going to the re-education camp and seeing him at all it doesn't help the characters reach another level like it right. does in the remake right yeah, in the remake you can short circuit that story like feature by making them train right like it doesn't matter how tough like one guy's tough right and we know why because he went to the military right so then everyone else now trains the property gets to be tough because the military guy trained right cool um that works the father in the remake, uh, Cullen's Mr. Eckerd works better because of what we see with like the mayor or whatever, I uh, forget, uh, right. Mr. Jenkins or whatever. Um, he's out there working with the mm -hmm. Greens and saying, hey guys, just turn yourself in. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be all good, trust us. And then, you know, the Korean uh, communist military guys want uh, Mr. Eckerd to do that too. And he's like, don't do it. <laughs> <You know>? uh, <laughs> Don't do it. It's not going to work out for you. Keep fighting. But it's not in this context of like abandon your humanity. It's just like, hey, right. you can't trust these people. If you come back, it's not going to end well for you. So he sacrifices himself to give them a chance to escape. Right. Way better use of a character. Mm -hmm. Way better use of, uh, of, like you said, motivation. It's revenge motivation 
makes a lot more sense. They just watched their father get murdered in cold blood for doing nothing other than saying, uh, stay safe out there. You know? And it just, it raised the stakes of the film. It raised the stakes for all these other kind of high schoolers who like loosely want to participate in this, this fight. And now they realize like, yeah, there is no place for them in this uh, society anymore. So they have to fight back. And mm. it, just, it just works so much better um, in, this, in this remake. Absolutely. And another thing it does is it gives us a clear enemy, right? Mm -hmm. we, we know who the bad guy is in the remake. We know it's this Captain Cho portrayed by William Yun Lee because he killed the dead. <laughs> okay, right. so there you go. <laughs> That's a clear indication of who are bad guys. He killed their dad. We have a feeling that that's going to come into the plot overall that they're going to have to avenge him. So they got to kill this guy. The dad in the original is just killed in a random firing squad. We don't know under whose orders necessarily. And there's like a couple sort of big baddies in the original. There's a one main one. It's uh, Colonel Ernesto Bella, portrayed by Ron O'Neill. He's kind of the main guy in charge. But again, remember we said there's we got the Cubans and the Nicaraguans and the Russians. Right. Like all sort of have their hands in the pot. So it's, it's kind of tough to tell at times exactly who's calling the shots but they seem to focus on this colonel ernesto a bit more than the others but you never really give him that scene to to show him showcase him as like the main villain like you do get in the remake where like oh i, I just shot your dad clearly i'm the villain yeah thank you and, and even like it makes sense when you look at will young lee's uh cap and show as these gorillas are getting more ground and like getting more wins, his ass is on the line. They're like, hey, dude, right. you got one job. We took over this district and you're telling me we got gorilla fighters out there? Hey, you either figure this out or you're out, dude. That makes sense. Versus Ron O'Neill's character, who, again, I like you mentioned, it's kind of clear that he seems to be one of the most important bad guys. There's no repercussion for four months of your troops getting their asses handed to them by high schoolers. And it should be because they keep getting <laughs> handed to them by the same fucking sneaky tactic that they haven't adapted to yet. Well, eight kids just killed 30 men again. Oh, yeah. well. Yeah. And like in this, in this original, it's almost like a switch just goes off. And I think it's because the movie is like, well, we got to end this eventually, right? <laughs> like you can't just do this <laughs> for another hour. I mean, I'm sure they could have, but... Um, <laughs> But, like, even that, though, when they adapt, it, it's not even really defined. It just kind of happens, right? They're like, well, eh, we got something for them. Yeah. And they step, they step their game up finally. But, you know, again, in the remake, with that scene with Captain Cho having to, you know, face the fact that he's going to get demoted. At the very best, he's going to get fired. At worst, I mean, it's the military. They might take you out. So yeah. he's got motivation to... Uh, ramp things up. So when it happens, it makes sense. There's setup for it. There's exposition. And um, it's also tied into this scene with Matt uh, trying to get his girlfriend back and stuff like that. Like, it, right. it, it works. <laughs> and there's nothing like that in the original movie to make you say, when is enough enough for the uh, sort of the communist insurgents that have taken over America? Yeah. <laughs> um. Should we go to the girl characters? You kind of mentioned Erica getting rescued in the remake. She doesn't... Yeah. She's <laughs> in the... The girl characters are in both films, but they sort of serve different roles. So it might be interesting to compare that. Um, like you said, Erica is dating Matt in the remake. Maybe we could just start there because it's a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so while the... Uh, North Koreans are starting their sort of descent upon this small town. Uh, Matt goes immediately to Erica to save her, but unfortunately he's unable to, and she ends up in one of those camps. They never really fully define um, what the camps are. They, in the original, they're re-education camps. In this remake, it seems like just more like a prison for people that are resistant overall. Um, so they have this plan one day to sort of blow up um, this big ceremony. And uh, 
while they're doing it, Matt sees Erica on one of these buses just being transported. So instead of following the plan, like he should, he decides to go save her and he starts, he gets things in motion a little bit earlier. And what happens is one of their team members gets killed. Um, he is ultimately able to save Erica, but at the cost of ultimately the plan, which gets, you know, found out anyway, because shows there just like holding the detonator, like, ah, oh, 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 I right. figured you out. And um, yeah, he, he saves her, but like we, they lose a member. So he kind of like goes into self exile at that point for a little bit. So that's Erica's sort of arc <laughs> in the, the remake. And then there's another girl, her name is Tony. This is sort of the love interest for Jed in the remake. She doesn't really do much. <laughs> She's just kind of there, kind of fawning over Jed at random times in the movie. Um, she's cousins of Erica. I didn't even know that until I read the synopsis on Wikipedia. Yeah, so. I was surprised. I yeah, know so that too. <laughs> she's there. Um, that's all you need to know. They're, they're the two kind of main female leads in both movies, and that's what they do pretty much in the remake. In the original, they're not dating either of the boys. In the original, they're kind of just given to the boys by their grandparents. Like, hey, we got something in the cellar you boys might like. <laughs> here's two young girls it's like yeah okay the, the russians tried to have their way with them but i think that sentence just ended after that like i don't <laughs> know what happened um yeah they they got these girls hiding out in their like barn and it's like they're going with you now and they hardly talk because yeah. reasons that we refuse to define um, <laughs> but they're portrayed by leah thompson and jennifer gray so we know they must be somewhat important since they're yeah. pretty big staples of the 80s <laughs> yeah yeah miss dirty dancer herself jennifer gray yeah um yeah again like you said they don't really talk too much to the boys once they're with them so we don't really learn much about them i mean jennifer gray's tony really doesn't do anything other than fight Leah Thompson kind of has a love thing going on with the older military guy, which we can get into, which was just came out of nowhere. We might as well, because I, I, I don't want to lose this thought, so yeah. we might as well get into that. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so in both movies, um, our Wolverines eventually sort of accidentally meet up with some outside military allies, I guess we could say. We'll start with the original. Uh, so that's Powers Booth as Lieutenant Colonel Andrew, Andy, Tanner, and the U.S. Air Force. Uh, so he's just called Tanner, pretty much. They coordinated with selective nuke strikes, and the missiles were a hell of a lot more accurate than we thought. They took out the silos here in the Dakotas. Um, he's just kind of by himself, and he randomly stumbles upon the Wolverines, and he's not really that useful because we're pretty deep into the war at this point so you think like oh maybe he could train them but they're already pretty well adapted to the art of guerrilla warfare at this point so he doesn't really train them what he does though is he kind of brings them information he's like right. this is what's happening with the world this is why we got invaded these are areas that are occupied and then there are other free zones so he's kind of mr exposition and just letting us know what happened because up to this point in the original we don't exactly know why <laughs> this is right. happening. I mean, you get the opening scroll to kind of tell you that the world's falling apart, but you don't know exactly how it happened. So he kind of tries to make sense of it all to our Wolverines. I mean, as written, you know, uh, we get this, I'm going to say, pretty racist uh, explanation of what's happened. Uh, there's <laughs> talk of Chinamen and things like that. And screaming Chinamen and stuff like that at one point who for some reason again as a person that studied some of this stuff for some reason the Chinese are, are our allies yeah we, that was weird against, I wasn't sure if I heard that right yeah yeah no um everyone else is out but China's in with America against communism which doesn't make any sense um, <laughs> at all but like you know he goes on this kind of explanation of the Cubans came in from the south but then we held the line like somewhere. I don't even remember. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. But, you know, you 
we were 40 miles away from free America. And yeah, I just, I don't know, like his introduction to the movie is blunted by the fact that, as you mentioned, they're already pretty proficient. It's not like mm -hmm. he does anything much different than um, what they would have. I guess they come up with a slightly better plan to free people from their re-education camp, but it's more of the same. Like we said before, you know, shoot, run, repeat. Like that's the movie in a nutshell. So, so then you've got this kind of weird connection with Leah Thompson's Erica that, again, very ill-defined. Like, I guess they share some moments together where they talk. But it's really awkward because, one, he's much older than her, mm -hmm. and he's married. Is like, he married? I didn't even know. Yeah, yeah, I know you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> they don't explain it. But he doesn't know what happened to his wife. Oh, right. Yeah, actually, yeah. Because he, he does kind of talk about his wife to her. Yeah, I do remember now. Yeah, because like she asked about her and he's like, you sure you want me to tell me about this? Mm -hmm. She's like, sure. Tell me about your wife that is probably still alive or maybe mm -hmm. not. I mean, we don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, like they have this super loose connection. And when uh, Tanner, because it just happens to his character, ultimately meets his demise randomly. <laughs> um, I guess it's kind of somebody's fault, but not really, you know. They wanted to fight a tank. <laughs> um, uh, like when he dies, she's affected. And that might be the second or third time in the movie where she says she'll never love again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, was a, that was a shocker. Um, for, yeah, the age difference was just like, there's no way they're really going to put these two characters together. Like in real life, I think he's maybe 12 years older than her, which isn't, terrible but like you know he looks a lot older and she's supposed to be i guess around the boy's age so we're gonna assume she's still in high school probably yeah. not even a senior yet so i'm gonna put her in that like kind of mid-teen range while sure. this guy is like very old looking and you know like he said married <laughs> so um it's just it just felt wrong that they were even hinting at a romance between these two didn't, I, I didn't i didn't like it didn't make sense um yeah there was no, like, there, one, there was no need for it either. Yeah. It doesn't uh, do anything for her character. Like, it doesn't, like we say, it doesn't take her character arc anywhere, really. It just gave her something to kind of do. But, like, after he's gone, it's not like she's like, well, now I'm going to fight harder for him or, like, live for him. It, it, it didn't really affect her in, in any significant way. No, she just kind of shells up more. So, like, you already had this kind of quiet character. Right that just went back to being a quiet character. <laughs> you know, I it just, I don't get it. Like I said, I did appreciate Tanner um, explaining what was happening because no one <laughs> wanted to do that before his introduction as a character. I was even confused when he first got introduced because like the way they filmed it, I thought he was like one of them because like they right. were going through fighting all these communists, capturing certain people and things like that. And this, you know, thematically in the movie felt like a scene where like, okay, the Wolverines have been taking advantage of us. I thought he was going to be like a plant, you know? Like, right. Here's a guy that seems like he's on your team and surprise, he's not. And that's not there at all. <laughs> it's yeah. much more interesting than the way they used him in the actual film. I, I really thought because of like, okay, this movie, like you said, this movie needs stakes and tension. Mm -hmm. That's where it's going to come from. That's why they quiz him about America. That's why they quiz him about the planes he flies. It was like, okay, he's able to pass these tests, but what they don't know is he's, you know, right. working behind the scenes. That would have worked. That didn't happen. So what yeah. we got is what we got. And at that point when they met him too, like none of the Wolverines had died. Mm -hmm. so just adding to your point that there's no stakes. There's no stakes to adding to the team. There's no, no, nothing bad happened because they added him to the team. So it's like, and he didn't really do anything other than just tell them what had already happened in the world because right. we didn't know. So it was helpful to us, but he didn't really help them at all. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that the only narrative purpose that he really served was to give us some background as to what was happening mm -hmm. in World War III. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, like, it, it didn't matter. Like, really, that could have been found out on the radio. That could have been found mm -hmm. out by scouting, you know? Yeah that you're 40 miles behind enemy lines. That's really the only thing we learned here. Right. And uh, like I said, the awkward relationship thing, you just, um, 
poor use of what could have been an interesting character. And I think um, I think Powers Booth had a pretty, from an acting perspective, I thought that he brought something to the movie. I can't really define it, but he felt fleshed out. You know, he felt mm-hmm. like a real character. So, though gaining him didn't do much and losing him didn't do much, like him being there did feel like the movie could have started going somewhere. You know, it did. Um, these remake military guys too, though, they serve a, a fairly similar role and I think in a lot of ways are similarly pointless. <laughs> well, I think they're a, a little more useful, but we can get into that. So I'll just introduce these characters. We have three military characters here. So Jeffrey Dean Morgan is our main one. He's Sergeant Major Andrew Andy Tanner. So that's the Tanner connection. And he's accompanied by Kenneth Choi as Captain Smith and Matt Gerald as Sergeant Hodges. And I'll say I think he they felt a little more necessary to the plot of the remake than Tanner did to the original. First off, they meet these military guys after like kind of a low point in the right. Wolverine's ordeal. Um, this is right after uh, Matt rescued Erica and then he kind of went to self-exile. He comes back a few days later and as he comes back, that's when the North Koreans decide to just blow the hell out of like the forest surrounding the area because like well we can't have this shit happen to us so they blow up the base of operations two members of the wolverines are killed after one already died while matt was rescuing erica so they're down three at this point they're really kind of unsure about like what are we going to do like matt goes to jed he's like I don't, everybody's not really sure if they want to keep doing this anymore you know it just it doesn't seem like it's paying off Right. Um, and then at this point, then that's when they run into this, these military uh, personnel. And, you know, it just, it just helps, you know, keep them in the fight at that point. And it does eventually drive the plot somewhere, too, which well, I'm sure we'll get into. No, that's fair. You're right. That, um, again, it's all about timing in this movie. Like, when we're introducing them, there is sort of a need to kind of bring this team back up. You know, um, so that that's very fair. Um, and again, talking about plausibility and plot, I appreciate that the Korean army is tired of their shit and was like, we're going to raise Earth. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it happens at a more meaningful point in the film than when uh, in the original they kind of do something similar. And you're right, they do, <clears throat> excuse me. And you're right, they do. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Wolverines. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wolverines. <laughs> um, and you're right, like their introduction does give us a place to go with the film in terms mm-hmm. of here's our new goal, this is what we're mm-hmm. going after. This could plausibly turn the tide of the actual war itself mm-hmm. versus the original where like I don't think there was ever a plan to do anything but kill commies for the rest of their days. Um, regardless of outcome Mm -hmm. wholeheartedly agree you said it before like they could have made this movie an hour longer if they wanted to because that's kind of all they wanted to do just kill commies and you could easily just fill in an hour's worth of just action just them popping up shoot commies moving on and doing it again like there was no (laughs) yeah there was no drive there was there wasn't like an end game (laughs) <laughs> for what they were doing they're just going to keep killing commies until until those planes stop flying around you know mm-hmm. so it's like all right but can we have some direction in this movie <laughs> like sure that that's something you could do but maybe we could have something more defined to follow which gracefully the the remake does give us a plot it, they give us a macguffin mm-hmm. <laughs> i guess we can go into that um because that's sort of tanner's whole point so um what they learned from, in addition to learning like kind of what's happened in the rest of the world, you know, kind of pointless stuff that we don't really need to know. Right. Um, they learned that, well, the Koreans, what they did was they have this EMP that knocked out all the electronics. So we can't communicate what they can. So they have this EMP resistant radio telephone that if captured <laughs> would enable the U.S. command to listen in on enemy communication and gain a tactical advantage 
an encounter offensive. That's taken right off Wikipedia. So nice. I just want to get that credit out there. Um, so they gave us a MacGuffin, like, oh, um, Colonel, uh, what's his name? Cho. Oh. Colonel, Captain, sorry. Captain Cho has a device that we need to get, all right? So you're going to use all that military experience you have, this grill warfare that you've been doing, and we're going to put it to this purpose okay it was cool they were taking out commies or north koreans but now we're gonna actually do something and it might help end the war like you said so i was like okay a little bit of a direction right. i appreciated that yeah and again uh, both scenarios are largely implausible um you know occupy the united states um right however uh, especially given the fact that you know nuclear proliferation all that stuff but uh <laughs> It, at least this remake gives me an actual plausible scenario through coordination with weirdly i think russia um uh the north koreans have used this electronic magnetic pulse device which takes out you know planes communication stuff like that so cool that's how they got here because we can't fight back because our electronics aren't working awesome let's do that versus this original film where you know they have to like right in the collapse of nato for this to even make sense versus the remake where they don't have to write anything mm -hmm. it's just all right like here's a weapon that we would have we would struggle to fight back against great makes it all make a little bit more sense it's that little skeptic uh thing in my head is like all right if that happened i'll suspend <laughs> disbelief this could happen and you know it does make this little guerrilla group make more sense because I think Tanner has that line where, you know, uh, they may have whatever weapons they have, but we still got this. And he picks up his rifle. And it's like, yeah, all right. So <laughs> cool. Like weapons that you actually can use in this scenario. Um, it, it, it's cool that they did that because it limits both parties' ability to fight a certain type of war. So like you would think, all right, let's just go fly over and blow some stuff up but like with this emp element mm -hmm. okay maybe there's a reason why that's not happening that much so i i did appreciate that and it, like you mentioned here we go now we're at the next phase of the movie we know what we're going after mm -hmm. so two-thirds of the film we're going into our third act mm -hmm. with a plan and a plot love that love a movie that has a, <laughs> a third act <laughs> um, <laughs> the original i just i i just never quite got it right like once they blew things up for the <laughs> fifth time it's just like all right even man I, I feel like i'm jumping around a little bit but like even when uh their version of sort of this communist fighting group decides to fight back i'm not really sure what that was mm -hmm. you know like was the the truck with the food on it was that a decoy that's well, what I was thinking, too. I was like, well, this is like a trap, right? But it doesn't... The food comes out, and then the retaliation, the helicopters, uh, don't come out for a while. Like, the kids right. like could have easily just gotten the food and went to a safe place, but they stupidly decide to eat the food right there for some mm -hmm. reason. So everybody's just being stupid, and then these helicopters come out and then just start, like, uh, attacking them, and that's the major retaliation from the commies is two helicopters. Because right, right. they had never fought helicopters before the, the Wolverines. And to your point, like, taking taking that same type of scenario where, like, okay, we've had enough. We're going to blow you guys up. No, no more fun and games. Mm -hmm. Bringing the military guys in after that scene is powerful. Bringing the military guy before the scene, having him die randomly, and then whatever that was uh, happened is not powerful. It's right. confusing. And I don't know what that was. I'm not sure why um, they're able to take on, like, five Harrier jets. You know, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, it, I guess it's cool they took one down, but it's like, what, the guys just get tired of killing them? They were just like, eh, let's go refuel or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's a strange choice. Yeah. I mean, I think we kind of hammered this point home, but, like, that – the original film it just once it gets to that four and a half minute mark it kind of just hits this 
<laughs> it just hits it just hits here and just keeps going at the same I speed it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere we don't we there's no new plot there's no there's in, they introduce a lot of new characters but it doesn't change what we've been doing the whole film it's just we're just gonna pop up and fight commies pop up and fight commies there's there's no direction I, yeah i guess to be fair not that it even matters here uh to be fair uh what does lead to this kind of situation um and the death is a betrayal in the uh, in the original film, um, which also happens in the remake, but kind of, like not I don't know, not really. It, it's different, right? Like the remake, by the time this betrayal happens, they kind of like solved the problem already. Like they mm-hmm. taken out the people that they needed to. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is that in the original film the mayor's son who's kind of like the student president or something like that who's part of their uh part of their group has been sneaking back in town like all of them have but has more or less collaborated with his his father and with the communists and in his own way gave up their location which led to our tanner character dying in this uh this original film and again because like you mentioned this plateau they make this choice of, all right, you've betrayed the team and we're going to kill you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, you know, there is this sort of back and forth for everyone, like, oh, uh, if we do this, how are we any different than them? And the character that has been sort of mm-hmm. getting more radicalized, more violent, just shoots him, right? Mm-hmm. But there's nothing, there's nothing no. else. Like, no. you shot him, we're not mad at that guy for shooting him. <laughs> we're not you know, infighting because we did that. We're just like, all right, this is who we are now. <laughs> and they move on. And it's just such a weird choice, in my opinion. And I'm, again, I don't get why those things are separate. Like, why is this betrayal separate than the communists getting the upper hand on them with the Jets? Like, why add an extra 20 or 30 minutes to your movie when you could just... Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, whereas the remake, like... I feel like they kept that plot in just to like keep it there because mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter. But um, the mayor's son in this situation has like a tracking device in him. But I again, the movies are for movies that shouldn't be. They are a little confusing. Um, I believe that that tracking device he wasn't aware that he had that on him. Mm-hmm. Um, like he got it from like an injury. He got surgery. And there's he got stabbed. Device. He got stabbed by a device that oh, wasn't quite a knife, and uh, they, it was a wound, and it was too deep for them to remove. So instead of removing it and putting, or yeah, instead of removing it and bringing him with them, they just left him to kind of fend yeah. for himself. Right. Which, you know, similar quality. Which is one you kind of keep the integrity of that character because he didn't rat out his friends basically Mm -hmm. but also like they still have to make this hard choice about him and it's more meaningful here because Mm -hmm. there's there's conflict in the choice um versus the original where like you really don't have a choice he's betrayed you you don't necessarily have to kill him but uh you know this remake you what are you gonna do right and it's a more meaningful moment in the film than what we get in the original Mm-hmm. Which is crazy considering that, like, he actually betrayed his friends. And yeah. that should have played a little bit more uh, to the plot. Yeah. Uh, I think the problem with that scene, the original, is just, like, you pretty much said, like, there's no consequences for the betrayal or see Thomas Howell's character kind of just losing his shit and just shooting him. Like, if they just go on and let's just keep doing what we've been doing, it's not going to affect anything. Uh, plot wise we're just you could have just have ignored that scene or fell asleep and woken up and we're going to be doing the same exact thing correct and to your point yeah they should have just used that to like okay now the big thing is happening now the helicopters are coming because of this tracking device but the tracking device isn't the thing that brings them down right it's kind of their own hubris at the the end It, it didn't really do anything but the tracking device does come in a big way in the remake because of what happens to one of our main characters. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's another it's another loss um, that they have to account for. And, you know, look, I, 
I appreciate I appreciate it because sure, do they make mistakes? Clearly, like this these remake uh guys, they are children. They act like children from time to time and they're doing their best, but it's war, right? Like these things happen and it's compelling to see people that like if they were military guys probably would not make the choices that they were making, but they're kids. So right. like I'm gonna go save my girlfriend. That's a very stupid thing to do, but okay, I, I get why a high school quarterback would do that. <laughs> I get why um, you know, you might try to communicate with your dad again or something like that. So there's actual, like you mentioned earlier, there's characters, there's death, and there's an arcs. So like all that makes these scenes more meaningful versus again in the original, and I know we've hammered this home, but like it's just a series of shooting random people. Like, mm -hmm. That's the entire film, really, um, until it, until it's not. <laughs> There's no real reason why it's not <laughs> at any point in the film. I, mean, I guess that's just the way they wrote it. They, I think you said it best. They just decided the movie has to end. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why it ended. It didn't have to end the way it did. But maybe we should go into the endings yeah, uh, to flesh this out a little bit more. I think we should start with the remake, because <laughs> <that's, Sure. laughs> it's just easier. <laughs> um, so the remake, like we said, they had to get this uh, EMP resistant thing. Um, ultimately what happens, they do come head to head with uh, Captain Cho. Uh, Jed is able to get the upper hand and kill him, kind of save the day and get revenge for his father all in one shot. The military personnel, they do lose a guy, Hodges. He dies in the, in the fight. But ultimately they're able to get what they were, you know, trying to get you know the, they had to get something and they got it yay plot um so they think hey we did it let's all relax a little bit let's celebrate you get a moment with jed and matt they kind of reconcile a little bit there um they, there's a cute little moment between them he's like hey my very first beer you know in that <laughs> mocking way that high school football kids probably say and then you think oh jed and tony finally like this whole movie she's been just like oh i just love jed i love jed so like finally like, okay let's see these two people hook up and then as soon as they're about to bam out of nowhere fucking nowhere i'm saying yeah. like he just gets shot in the back of the head and you're like what this didn't happen in the original what is going on here the whole house that they're kind of like just holding up in it, it just gets like invaded by all these koreans they're just getting shot at they barely make it out of there everybody is able to make it out except for jed and then everybody's just like freaking out nobody knows what's going on and then they're all in this escape vehicle and then on their way they're like how did this happen like it must have been like somebody must have told them like no way and then one of the guys is like wait a minute wait a minute let me see that wound you got there daryl so the mayor's kid again like you said he's got lifts his shirt up he's got this wound it doesn't quite look like a normal knife wound and then they realize oh it's a tracking device that's how they got us and like we said before they can't get to the wound or they can't get to the tracking to the bite yeah they can't get to the tracking device so they have to just leave him to kind of fend for himself while they take the emp device to the helicopter um, so that the military, so Tanner can take it and uh, ultimately win the war, I guess. So they take Tanner and his partner there. Um, they get to the helicopter, the rendezvous point, And then as Tanner's about to leave, he's like, you can come with us. You know, there's plenty of room on the helicopter. And then Matt steps up and he goes, no, man, we're going to stay and we're going to fight. So, and then Tanner's like, All right, fuck him. <laughs> good luck, man. <laughs> I'm out of here. So he goes um they get the emp to where they need to go and then the movie just kind of ends with matt kind of stepping up into jed's role and leading these new recruits talking about we're gonna keep fighting we're never gonna stop and we're the wolverines wolverines and then he kind of just leads them and that's kind of how the movie ends the fight's still going on but you do have this feeling of hope because now we have that that emp device right right and you know, again, going into that, what you're saying here is that that rallying cry, Wolverines, serves a purpose in this film, right? Like, we've talked about it a little bit, but basically the movie does a really good job of showing kind of like the liberation effort in the town, the, uh, the sort of groundswell of support, 
the fact that the Korean army is trying to tamp down the support through their actions. And ultimately, like the idea that they recruited more people is perfect because that's the, that's the goal of this guerrilla unit is that we're going to fight back. We got our people, Wolverines, we don't quit and stuff like that. So like there's meaning in what ultimately could be a meaningless fight. Like the fact that the United States government is being, well, excuse me, the United States territory is being occupied and there's a bunch of kids is ultimately kind of meaningless, right? But if they're able to inspire people and get people to fight back, maybe they can win this war. And I think that to your point about that ending, the movie does a good job of framing that that feeling and uh, that idea that like, though we don't know how this ends, the fight feels like it's going our way. Mm-hmm. Awesome, cool, yeah. <laughs> movie. <laughs> You don't, expect, you don't expect them to like win the war like that, right? Because that would be just too neat of a package. So it's giving us this little glimmer of hope. Like, we got this device. They're recruiting more people. You know, we lost a main character, but his brother seems, you know, he seems like he's got a pretty solid head on him. Like, he can be a true leader now. So, you know, you're left with uh, some hope there. So, uh, let's get into the original. Into um, the original. Do you want to start right um pretty much the big fallout where the helicopters come in. I think that might be. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've lost our Lieutenant Tanner. Um, we get a little bit more of like our standard liberation shoot Wolverines uh, action. There's a scene where um, at this point, it's been probably about four or five months since the original events. They see, uh, see the caravan of trucks like they've seen 20 times already in this movie. Some supplies fall off it. They send Jennifer Grey out there to like act like a wildling. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's absurd. Um, it's absurd. So, for some reason, I guess that's connected to the fact that like now, the Nicaraguan, Cuban, Russian army knows where they are. They go up into some rocks, which I think. Are these the same rocks where they just write down people's names when they die? Like, they're in that area? It, it Maybe. Matter. Sure. Why not? <laughs> cool. Uh, Jennifer Grey is randomly, like, dripping orange juice juice in, onto Patrick Swayze. Yeah, and it's cute for some reason. I don't know, man. It's, <laughs> I think it's supposed to be. And you get that kind of that death from above. Da, 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 da. <laughs> you know? The, the Russian, Cuban, Nicaraguans come. <laughs> um, and look, man, it's like five helicopters. They've got RPGs. They've got heavy machine gun fire. And the Wolverines, as they have always been, <laughs> are outmatched. <laughs> 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 and they're just getting picked off left and right. I mean, I think Chuck, Chuck Sheen's able to <laughs> fire off an RPG <laughs> at one point. Um, I believe Jennifer Grey gets hit, um, and, you know, people are, like I said, people are dying. Jennifer Grey's character is dying. She's like, just leave me with a grenade. <laughs> <laughs> and, See Thomas uh, Howell's character gets shot, too, like, finally, like, his crazy ass. Yeah, yeah, he, 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 right. His is kind of like that, again, that blaze of glory thing, which is, he shoots, it actually was him, he shoots off the RPG, he's firing uh, machine guns at the helicopter and he just gets mowed down <laughs> um, again as probably would happen <laughs> uh, <laughs> they had helicopters to <laughs> this should happen an hour ago <laughs> um, so yeah I mean their ranks are depleted Jeb and brother get out um, Jennifer Gray's character is left behind the insurgent army comes up, comes up on her and she blows herself up in her last act, and it sets up the stage for them to make one final push on the town. Again, I'm not sure why. (laughs) I Uh, think they realize they're in a dire situation, and there's no way they can actually win this thing. So instead of um, keeping the fight going, which would seem pointless, which which is unfortunate because we've been watching the fucking whole fight for almost two hours, um, so they decide to end it all, but... um, Jed and Matt are going to kind of distract the army while Erica and Danny 
which is a character we haven't talked about because he doesn't really fucking do anything. Mm -hmm. But there's a character called Danny in there. Um, they decide to fight the Kami so that Danny and Erica can escape and get make it to the the free area where it's there's still America and all that stuff. That's yeah. what I got from it. That, that's about right. And then you get more of basically the B-roll that is this movie. A random thing is getting blown up. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, driving trucks into the, like the, the excuse me, the re-education camp, shooting at people. Uh, towards the end, I believe, yeah, Chuck Sheen gets uh, gets shot and Patrick Swayze has to like carry him through town and our big bad allegedly sees him <laughs> and just like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fancy seeing you here. <laughs> He's got them dead to rights. His gun is on him. And he just, Swayze gives him this, like, this look, like, it's my brother, man. <laughs> and he goes to, like, cry in the middle of the town square uh, while Danny and um, Erica escape town. And then there's this insane <laughs> scene at the end where, like, they basically, like, the story of the Wolverines is over. And we get to see a memorial of the Wolverines uh, that is placed near the rock where they wrote down the names of everyone that died previously. And I do see that you have notes as to what it says on that. Um, I'll read it. Okay, go for it. <laughs> I think uh, it's Erica's character says, in the early days of World War III, gorillas, mostly children, <laughs> placed the names of their lost upon this rock. They fought here alone and gave up their lives so that this nation shall not perish from the earth. So more or less, what we got there was two hours of, um, of uh, masturbatory um, xenophobic propaganda that's designed to make, um, <laughs> designed to make you think that like your common high schooler could take on Russian troops. Um, it's not true. <laughs> it's a stupid plot and uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I guess it was cool. <laughs> Because the Wolverine shot people for <laughs> over an hour and a half. And, you know, towards the end, they got a memorial. So that's something that we're good at as, as a country, memorializing our, our mostly children fighters. I, <laughs> that, that was too aggressive of a line, Dan. I'm going to dial back. <laughs> <laughs> it was just kind of dumb the whole time, right? Like, just, yeah, it was completely dumb. And like, I think you said it best. The movie just decides it's going to end. Like, they don't have to shoot up the place and die. They could have just kept going because that's what they've been doing the whole movie. They haven't <laughs> made a decision to like, like I said, there was no end game. They're just going to keep right. fighting and they could have just, they could have just kept fighting and kind of like faded out like with a voiceover and then they kept fighting and eventually one day they won the freedom back for America. Like it, it didn't really fucking matter at that point. The movie was just done. They were just like, <laughs> all right, let's kill these characters. Let's end this shit and maybe two of them get away. There you go. That's an ending. Yeah, and, and they give him this memorial so that it feels like none of this was in vain. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just such a weird. It's just a weird movie, right? Like, yeah. you, you know, you, the Russians attack. You shoot them. You shoot them some more. You shoot them some more. They finally start taking out your ranks. You get a little bit of revenge. They get more revenge. You, one last push. Like I thought that when Tanner was introduced in the movie, that our focus would shift from the fight to trying to get to free America, you know, like mm. let's get out of this occupied zone. Maybe they have Intel they can share with troops on the other side. Like what's like, you would think that there was a point because they filmed the movie. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Ultimately, I think, you know, like Hollywood does sometimes someone thought it was cool. If a ragtag group of like, High schoolers and their older brother of one <laughs> fought the Russians for like four months in Colorado, which has a lot of strategic, um, you know, advantages for Russian troops, if you think about it, being in Colorado. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, I was confused and I, I'll save my other thoughts for after, after this. Yeah, it was... It was a bizarre ride. There's no plot in this, this is original film. I mean, there's no plot. It, it, like I said, once you hit that four and a half minute mark, it just stays there. It doesn't change direction. It never gets a direction. It's just like, okay, we're going to fight. And like you said, 
we win a lot and we lose a little bit. We win a little bit more. We lose a little bit more. And let's just decide to end here. Yeah. Nothing happens, man. It, it's exhausting. <laughs> it's, I, you're waiting for something to happen. Like, yeah, the introduction of Tanner should have pushed the movie in a direction like the remake did, but it doesn't. It just, let's just keep going with plus one. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all they do. And uh, it just decides to end in such a weird way. It, it was bizarre. I, I don't know how else to describe it. I had no experience watching this original film and I could not have predicted that I would have just stay at this thing for right. after from the four and a half minute mark. Like it was, it's bold. It's bold, Reggie. I don't, yeah. I can't name too many movies that just hit the ground running and just stay at the same spot. Right. right. No, no, two no hours. ramp up, no, no pull back. You know, I, I have seen this movie before. So I think that because I saw it when I was in high school, I thought the concept was like kind of cool because I was in high school, <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd show some, you know, in a fight, I'd do something like, I know that's not true now, right? Like, <laughs> you know, I, I've seen enough like Michael Bay movies, you know, anything by Bruckheimer and like, <laughs> sure, it gets me hype, you know, I'm a red blooded American like everybody else, but like, I know if elite Russian Spetsnaz troops came into my town, I'm probably not gonna do so good, you know? <laughs> And I guess that's my bad for not learning how to hunt deer or something, which is, absurd. again, absurd. It's because you never learned how to not cry. That's why. Yeah, that's true. And I didn't, my dad wasn't tough enough on me. <laughs> I didn't get enough, a tough enough skin to, you know, slightly hold out for three months before getting murdered anyway by <laughs> Russians. You know, like, great. Free, that's, that's the legacy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we actually died while... Everyone else in town actually lived. <laughs> and ultimately were liberated by um, our military. So, but at least they died free. And that's the only thing that matters. Because if you die without your freedom, you're not even, uh, I don't know, a man, American. Not human. Um, you're just human. A, you're just commie scum. You're nothing. Yeah. <laughs> How could you quit in the fight against pure evil? <laughs> you know? It, it, the movie's propaganda. And look, I, I love some good 80s propaganda, like uh, Rocky IV. <laughs> if I can change, you can change. You know? <laughs> but um, what, what I think is a problem with this film is that, like, we're, we're ramping down. Like, they, they may not know this yet, but the Cold War is coming to an end. You know, like I mentioned, Rocky IV signals the end of the Cold War, as we all know. And it's just like, going back and revisiting that time, that paranoia that our country went through, it's hard to take a 2021 20, lens and say, oh yeah, like this is exciting. Like, you know, I guess if I had a mortal enemy that has been kind of terrorizing me for 30 you know, years, mm -hmm. sure, sure, you could show me anybody shooting them, right? But like, it's, there's more to it, <laughs> you know, it's more to life than that. It, just not, not a great plot, man, like you said. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if there's anything else we need to discuss well, in either film. I mean, I know, you... that, I know that we talked about the action, but uh, do you, what do you think about, like, the choice of, uh, like, how they portray the action in the films? Because, like, in the original movie, it's kind of like grenades and RPGs randomly with some shooting. I did appreciate that, like, the remake actually took on, like, a real, like, guerrilla-style, street-level, almost like, you know, depends on who's, who's saying it, but, like, this terrorist-style, like, fight. And I think that they portrayed that um, actually decently in that remake. Yeah, they changed it up. It wasn't always the same thing like the original it was mostly just let's just surround them surprise them shoot them like you said there was that one scene where jennifer gray goes to the gas station and then she runs and then they pop out of the ground which was the only variety we ever really had in the original which at least in the remake too it was kind of cool <laughs> they did they do that scene in the remake again but that was like the first thing they did in the remake um and then they do various things they do things with c4 like there's a skateboard at one point that has like c4 and then it just rolls and just like creates this huge, huge explosion. So they, they change it up because it can be exhausting 
when you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. So I appreciated, um, you know, the variety of the action in the remake. And plus, it was just, it was, it was also a shorter film, too. So they didn't have to fill it up with these over-the-top action sequences, which were just pretty much the same thing over and over. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, you can't talk about the films without that. But, like, mm-hmm. you know, the first time you, do, you see a shootout, all right, that's kind of cool. You know, the first time they do an RPG, all right, that's kind of cool. They they stepped it up. But after that, you just watch, rinse, repeat. And, um, you know, at, at a certain point, just some guy is standing on a hill saying, Wolverines, and then not capitalizing on the fact that, like, they made a strategic choice there. Um, like you said, it's tiring. It's mm-hmm. just fucking tiring. And the remake... I almost wish they didn't say Wolverines because they reminded me of the original movie. <laughs> but like um, having that Wolverines moniker actually worked because the movie allows for other characters to be in this fight in their own way. You know, you might not go shoot somebody, but you might hear, oh, give me your clothes. I'll give you a change of outfits so you can escape. Uh, you know, Here's some intel. Here's some ammo. And it's like this backdoor, almost like secret society of people fighting back. That's far more intriguing. And it means that when people die, it doesn't matter. Because like it's like Batman. Like, these are the Wolverines. Like, it doesn't have to be this group of people. It could be this other group. By making it one singular group of people <laughs> with no real apparent plan, uh, it, it just, you know, yelling Wolverines just got to be tiring and stupid yeah anything else reggie you want to touch on i don't remember any of the music that's <laughs> i don't remember the music either um i just remember like the theme song kind of sounded like very like militaristic in the original i don't really remember the music in the remake yeah so and we you know like you said we missed a perfect opportunity for an 80s montage in that original film and i know man give us anything could have done something there all right, are we there, Reggie? I think we're there. All right. So <laughs> this might be one of those situations where we kind of reverse it, but I'll still ask you, just in honor of tradition, Reggie, should the remake Red Dawn exist? Well, from listening to us talk throughout this podcast, you may um, think that I'm like saying that these elements in the remake that work are good. Um, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they, uh, they are there. Um, I actually found the movie to be similarly boring um, in the sense that, that um, it's too tied to this original <laughs> nonsensical plot. Um, Hemsworth's okay, but like, I don't know, he's, he's been better in different things. They don't really let him explore. There's not really any comedy, per se, in the movie. So, And I think Hemsworth does that really well. He does tough guy with a sense of humor extremely well. Um, we don't see that. Josh uh, from Drake and Josh, um, I was surprised in the movie and that was kind of distracting for me because I was more aware of some of his other stuff, but he did a good job in the film. But it's just, um, it's still too thin of a plot. The CGI takes me out of it from time to time. It's certainly more compelling, but um, there are better movies, action movies. So I don't think the remake should exist because it's kind of like a rehash movie like that, you know? Um, in the original, which when I, when you first said we were going to watch Red Dawn, I got excited because I remember it's like, yeah, it's Swayze, right? Like, fuck yeah, we're going to watch a Swayze movie. And then watching it, I was like, oh, I was really dumb when I first watched this. Like, my brain wasn't fully developed, so this was okay. And re-watching it, I'm just like, this is the dumbest shit. Um, this is up there with some of the dumbest stuff we've watched for this podcast. It makes Point Break look kind of good. And I'm talking about the remake. <laughs> 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 so, no, um, neither film should exist, but if one of them does exist, I guess it would be the remake, which is nuts because it's referencing another film. So, uh, um, yeah, that's just a no for me, dog. <laughs> Fair enough, Reggie. I'll be a little more lenient in my judgment. I'll say the remake should exist just because 
wow, what a dumpster fire that original film was. I don't know if anybody uh, likes this original film, but you should feel bad because this <laughs> original film is awful. I mean, it's funny because there's a lot of 80s classics I haven't seen. And there's always people like we were talking about The Thing. Oh, you haven't seen The Thing? You got to watch The Thing. I don't recall anybody ever telling me, man, you got to see that Red Dawn. How have you never seen Red Dawn? And thankfully so, because wow, I didn't, I didn't expect it to be so bad. I can't believe how bad the original film was. It set the bar so low that the remake, I was so happy that we I got any plot at all. It, it, I, so, like, for me, it wasn't like, oh, this is just an okay remake of this terrible film. This was like, oh, I, there's actually stuff I can follow in this remake. So I was just like, yes, yes, yes. I was so happy that I got anything in the remake. And, you know, because the bar was so low so you know it got it's on a big learning curve the, yeah. the remake but like i was happy enough with it it you know it made some nods to the original it had made fun of that deer blood scene yeah, that which was... i was just like that's so fucking gross man and not just because i'm vegan but like jesus the diseases alone in that deer blood I mean, correct it's ridiculous um and then like you know the twists to it you know killing chris hemsworth's character like i thought it was like oh shit like there's stuff i didn't see coming so like i appreciate that kind of thing yeah. and uh like i said my more coherent plot characters you know you spent a little bit of time with them so i, I kind of cared about them a little bit uh, yeah it did enough so i think the remake should exist yeah no that, that's fair and um you know given uh the subject matter of the film and stuff like that. Um, me. Given the subject matter of the film uh, and recent events in our own country, too, <laughs> with, uh, the storming of the Capitol and stuff like that, th this movie is a healthy reminder to me that um, we can't allow ourselves to become so singularly minded about other people, right? Like, um, whether again, whether that's if you're a liberal and we're talking about Trump supporters, if you're like an American, you're talking about Russians or Koreans or something like that. Like, yes, there, are, there, we have foreign enemies and stuff like that as, as a country, as all countries do. But like, don't let yourself be so dumb <laughs> that you could sit down and watch like a Red Dawn and be like, fuck yeah, America. <laughs> like, no, no, it's a dumb movie. Like, have a reason to be upset with somebody. Like, have a real reason to be mad at people. And uh, if you don't, you're probably just being a big fucking dummy. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, that's my uh, the more you know PSA. Um, I'm not saying we all got to get along and agree with each other, but I am saying uh, let's not be so dumb about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So I think we already have our next films picked out, don't we, Reggie? Yeah, yeah, actually. Um, I think that it'd be a good idea for Black History Month <laughs> to watch the movie Superfly. Whoa! All Which, right. Uh, well, yeah, let's check out a very Superfly. recent remake. I did not know year. a remake existed, so I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Superfly, the exploitation film, will be our next movie. <laughs> That one will be able to talk about the music a little bit more, I think. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that was our episode for today. Uh, let us know what you thought. Did you agree with us? Did you disagree with us? Is Red Dawn one of your favorite movies? Let us know why. <laughs> God, we. I would love to know why it's anybody's favorite movie. Um, but, um, you know, follow us on the social medias, the Twitters, the Facebooks, the Instagrams. Leave comments on YouTube, on iTunes, if you can. Um, did I miss anything, Ray? No, I think you got it. All right, cool. I guess I'm Dan Bulick. I'm Reggie Parker. And this has been another episode of Retro vs. Remake. Do it with a little bit of flair now. <laughs> <laughs> okay.